I'm James Quantis, editor and publisher of the Resource Opportunities Investment Newsletter, a subscriber-supported uh, newsletter. And joining me today is Doug Eaton, the president and CEO of Strategic Metals. Strategic is a project generator. That's the Yukon's uh, largest claims holder. Uh, they have a healthy treasury as well as um, equity, quite large equity stakes in other public companies. Hi, Doug. Welcome. Hi, thank you very much, James. I'm uh, looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. Why don't we start with Mount Hinton? So it's a, a wholly owned project that Strategic has found some uh, really high grade uh, and bonanza grade chip samples uh, the last couple summers and you plan to drill that this summer. So can you talk about the drill program and whether that's been affected by COVID-19 and, and whether it's going to go ahead? Okay, so, uh, first a little bit about the program itself and then we'll talk about the uh, possible impact of the virus. Um, the program itself uh, is scheduled to start sometime in June, uh, probably mid-June. Uh, we'll be uh, expanding road systems that already exist on the property to get uh, better road access into some of the discovery areas. Um, there's a number of historic veins that have never been drilled uh, that we can certainly target this year. But I think our most exciting target was a new discovery we made last year in an area that uh, uh, really has seen a lot of activity in, in recent years due to some placer gold discoveries. The placer miners have really improved access into that part of the property. And follow up of some soil samples we took led to the discovery of the bonanza uh, grade mineralization you were describing. Um, what's unusual about that mineralization is that it's got native gold in it. And previous work on that property and in that district has never reported native gold. Um, and it's quite splashy in places. The one sample graded uh, close to 80 ounces per ton. And after that, we stopped sampling uh, uh, material that had native gold in it. Um, the most important aspect, I think, of that is that in the Keno Hill District, which we're on the southern edge of, uh, the vein, uh, veins tend to be uh, through going, very, very extensive, but they're often dismembered by faults. Um, and when you go through different stratigraphies, they tend to uh, to bifurcate and and, uh, and narrow in the in the more uh, ductile units and are and blow out in the more brittle ones. So my experience in that district has been that if you can strip along the veins, then you get a much idea, better idea of what how they behave three dimensionally. Um, so that's what we would start with is is road construction and trenching, and then in the latter part of the summer, move the drills in and start drilling underneath some of the best surface exposures. And now, this, has there been some high-grade uh, mining in the past? This uh, particular property has had a little bit of high-grade mining, but the Keno Hill District was, that was the foundation of the whole district with high-grade work. And one of the reasons that we haven't moved this property on to a joint venture partner or some optionary, option E is that we want to keep a big equity stake right now. We own it 100% with no royalties. Uh, there's a chance in this particular setting to have bonanza grade material that's a real glory hole, right to surface, something you could go in and operate on a small scale, uh, either by hand sorting or with a small mill. And the company happens to own 100 ton per day mill. So if we were lucky enough to find something in that size range, we, we don't even have to go and buy equipment. And like, um, obviously there's lots of work to do and, and um, the truth machine and so on, but best case scenario, could you possibly spin something like that out or are you well, not looking that far ahead? I, absolutely. I think that's a possibility, James, but we're not looking that far ahead. I, I think that my, I think we have to be pragmatic. Uh, we have to see where the gold pricing goes. We have to see what, how our expiration works out, but yeah, it's certainly, it, it's good enough to be a standalone company if that was the way uh, it, it looked like this best route to go for sure. Yeah. So Yukon a while back, you know, uh, closed the borders because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I've seen some concerns from, um, you know, First Nations groups, among others, about, um, about the uh, pace of any restart or any work. Where's Mount Hinton uh, in that as far as um, local relationships and, and, whether, and the effect on the drill campaign, if any? Okay, well, for, first of all, uh, it's fully permitted so that in, in regards to getting new permits, we don't have to worry about that. We, we've already got our uh, class three expiration permit. Um, in terms of COVID, what they've done is they, uh, the government of Yukon and in conjunction with the First Nations 
have had discussions uh, uh, and they've come out with, Chief Medical Officer has come out with a policy uh, regarding exploration camps, mining camps. The two mines in Yukon are still operating. They've just changed their rotation schedules. Um, if you're using almost exclusively or exclusively Yukon-based workers, you really don't have much of a problem. It's people coming into the territory who are expected to self-quarantine for 14 days. So um, we'd have to look. Uh, you know, right now, I think we could source all the people we need from inside the territory, which means really we don't have a lot of uh, regulations pertaining to it. You know, there are safety regulations in the camps, obviously. We'll do everything we can to make sure people uh, keep good separation. That shouldn't be, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, in terms of the local First Nation, yeah, they're, they're worried. They're concerned about the health of their elders in particular. But the largest mine in Yukon is in their territory and is operating effectively at the present time. There's a lot of plaster miners who are working up there, already getting their camps opened up. So it's not like we're breaking new territory. Right. Um, OK. Uh, and what kind, of, what kind of meterage are you looking at for this year? You know, that'll, that'll depend. I, I think we're going to have at least 4,000 meters. But uh, I think we're going to, the idea is to have a contingency in there that would allow us to probably double it or more. Um, really, I, I don't think there's a limitation. We're, as you said, we're quite well funded. Uh, you know, if the results are warranted and we've got enough of uh, the season left, we'll keep going as long as the results are, are truly exciting. Now, that's a, that's a fair size program for, you know, for strategic, right? Compared to what you, typic what you typically do on a project. Yeah, we, we generally don't, although... Where we've got involved with projects that have had really, really good results, we've, we've done quite well on them in the past. Uh, so yeah, no, we, we would push ahead. But again, if we get an offer from a partner who wants to at some point come in and joint venture with us and we feel we're left with enough of an equity stake that it's, uh, it's worthwhile doing the deal, we won't say no. We're, we're quite, again, we're very pragmatic about the way we tackle our exploration and our funding. Right. right. Okay. Why don't we move on to um, COVID-19? Uh, so Doug, you, you uh, tested positive yourself for yeah. COVID-19. Yeah. Tell, tell me about that uh, experience and, and uh, how that's played yeah. out. It was interesting because I was one of the first, uh, about, about case 70 in the, in the province of BC, um, contracted it uh, along with my daughter, uh, from uh, a visitor who came up from the, from the U.S. from, from Washington State, um, he arrived up in in Vancouver and and came down with what we thought was the flu. Uh, there's nothing in his symptoms to suggest it was anything but a normal flu. And uh, you know, about uh, four or five days later, uh, my daughter started to get symptoms. And fortunately for her, her doctor recognized that they were enough like COVID that she should be tested, which she was and uh, tested surprisingly positive. And uh, so I was notified right away that we'd been exposed. And uh, so I went in and got tested. And, and at that point I had no symptoms, but tested positive. And later that night, I, I started to uh, show symptoms. I, in my case, it was like a mild flu. I, I had a very restless sleep the first night. I, I had a very mild headache and a very, very slight fever the next morning. Uh, uh, was tired all day. Um, really, uh, my biggest symptoms were for a couple of days I was really tired, and for about three days I had extremely achy muscles, especially in the torso. Never got into my chest. Um, never had any other uh, serious neurological problems or or heart problems that a few people have encountered with COVID. So, uh, all in all, my experience was was a very mild case. I think. Um, uh, uh, I, I was one of the first 20 people in the province who was declared cured by, by the medical workers. Oh yeah. So now you attended PDAC, but you, but you don't think that's where you. No, I think there's a it. very, very low probability, both in terms of the incubation period, but also uh, just the, the tracking that, uh, you know, there was such a, the, the person that we came in contact with, uh, you know, almost certainly was 0. .0. And there was a couple other people who contracted it beside me that, from that person. So it's almost certain that that's where it came from. 
Right, right. Washington State was one of the worst uh, early areas. Yeah, I know this was really early. This was way back in early March. It was, we were, uh, uh, I can laugh about it because I've already had it, but it, but it, it was, uh, um, you know, in my case, it, it wasn't a, a, a terribly devastating experience. So it was just after PDC then? Yeah. Yeah. And then you've done, you've done some uh, tests since then, have you? Or participated yeah. in some? Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, initially they said, oh, you know, you'll have to have two false negatives, but that the government very quickly realized they didn't have enough swabs to do that. So uh, they just say, declare after 10 days of being symptom free, you're cured. But because of that, you're never, you know, really sure where you're at. So I, I've participated in one program through the Canadian Blood Services, which is looking at using plasma for people who have COVID to treat really ill people. And then a second uh, uh, test uh, through the Infectious Disease Center, which is looking at developing antibodies for uh, antibody testing to see, you know, how many people who didn't think they had COVID actually did. Because as most people realize, very quickly uh, after the epidemic started, they, they stopped testing a lot of people who, who had positive symptoms. Right, right. You become a bit of a lab rat in some senses. I pretty much had to. I've been asked by a lot of people <laughs> what it's like to have COVID. So, so where are you, Doug, on the, on the continuum of, you know, like uh, just a flu or maybe not quite that far to, you know, let's keep everything shut down, you know, for the rest of the year. I mean, what, what's your sense of um, how long things can stay shut down um, or in limbo like this? You know, really, the, the biggest problem with it is that um, without the antibody testing and without really wide uh, spread testing, which, which it, it, it's a little bit too late for it, there's studies being done that suggest infectious rates could be 100 times what the reported cases are. If that's the case, we're beginning to get herd, men, uh, herd immunity and it may not be that bad. If you look at just the test case confirmed, you know, might be one person in, in 2,000 in the worldwide has, has had COVID so far. So could be an avalanche other. My, my gut feeling is that, you know, unfortunately it's really devastating for elderly people. Uh, for people who've got compromised immunity, it's very bad. Uh, for most other people, it's not gonna be that much of an inconvenience. And I think that, you know, as they get antibody testing, I think they're going to find that there's a lot more people who have had it than realize they've had it. Um, a lot of people are totally asymptomatic. Uh, other people have got mild cases like mine, which you, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think would be COVID. So I, I'm optimistic that, you know, we're, I think, I think we will have a second wave, but I, but I, I, I do think we'll get by this um, without, Again, there's still gonna be a lot of grief in some families because people have passed away, but but I don't think it's gonna be scenarios by any stretch. Yeah, yeah. And I guess as far as the impact on uh, mining exploration, I mean, it kind of varies quite uh, widely. Some mines have shut down, but in other jurisdictions, in Canada in particular, it's a mining and exploration have been declared an essential uh, essential service. Yeah, and they have in Yukon as well. And I, and I think that that is very telling. Uh, especially in Yukon, it's uh, aside from government work, it's it's the, really the only industry they have up there. It's results in a in a lot of really high quality jobs for for local residents and a lot of services related to the industry. So there's going to be a real effort to keep it going. Now, in terms of exploration, you know, really most of our work, um, it's pretty easy. It's like a construction site. It's fairly easy to be self isolated. There's not a lot of interaction. Um, you know, it's mostly when you get back in the camp. So we'll have to have uh, protocols relating to, you know, how people use the washrooms and how people, you know, uh, how many people will be in the kitchen at one time, that kind of thing. But I, I don't think it's going to, you know, again, if people follow the same kind of cleanliness protocols that they have in, uh, in other industries, I don't think we should be adversely affected. Right. Right. Okay, well, why don't we move to uh, move on to investing and investment. So Strategic has quite a large um, equity portfolio. Um, what's the last, and, and I guess somewhat active uh, in the market as far as purchasing equities from time to time. So I was curious what the last stock is that, uh, that Strategic as a company uh, purchased and why, and what's your uh, sort of latest uh, investment personally? Okay, well, let, let, let's start with the company. Mm -hmm. um, the, I think the last purchase that we made in the company was GT Gold. Uh, 
we uh, we played it a couple times already, but the most recent purchases were made last fall when the prices slumped down into the 75 cent range, 75, 80 cent range. And we've done quite well, it's up, up in the dollar 30 range now. Um, I, we see a lot of upside in that project still. We, we think good management and really good project, good backers with Newmont involved. And we'll probably hold on to that you know, for some time yet because we, we think it's not as topped out yet. Um, what sort of, what sort of, sorry to interrupt, what sort of parameters, um, like as far as the investments within the company, what kind of you know, parameters that you follow? Or? What, what we generally try to do if we can is we try to look for projects where we, uh, we really like the management, first of all, uh, because expiration is expiration. You, you, uh, you know, there's a lot of risk involved with any given project, but good management generally will, you know, has the ability to stay with projects uh, and, and, and stay with companies. And if the first project doesn't work out, they'll find something else for it. So often you get a kiss down the line. Good example of that is Precipitate, which uh, we've got about uh, 23, 22% of that company uh, shares, uh, over 20 million shares. Um, we bought that or got our first shares uh, through uh, by, by providing a project to them for their IPO property. Uh, then they went uh, went off uh, and acquired some ground in the Dominican Republic. And one of the downturns, they got very cash tight. So we stepped in and bought some more shares because we like management and uh, had some warrants, which we've subsequently exercised as well. And so our our between our share price and our exercise warrants, there are and our original stock that we got, our average price is about 10 cents and it's around 20 cents today. Right. Um, they just did the JV with uh, Eric, right? That's right. So there's a lot of lift in that stock. And I think over time, we're going to do really well on it. I don't think it's stopped out yet either. Um, they got some the, the JV with Barrick, and they got another project, which is very interesting in its own right. So, um, you know, we're, we're quite optimistic that project will move ahead well. But that's, so that's what we look for, generally. Good management, and then secondly, a good, strong project we think could deliver some great results. Okay. First, okay. Personally, your question about what, what was my last investment, I'm kind of embarrassed. Here I am, a junior mining guy, and my last investment was buying uh, Amazon. Um, and you I, had I, I, Yeah, in one of, the, one of the, the little down ticks here in the last little while, and, and the reason was that uh, although I've got other tech stocks in my portfolio, I've always felt that Amazon was was overvalued, and it seemed like a, a good entry point. And uh, so I got it in about 1850, and uh, so it's gone up about 23, 24, uh, 100 range now. So it it was a timely investment, but it was that was based strictly on market fundamentals, saying uh, you know the, there is a company that could benefit from the, the virus. The, the, if people are stuck at home, what are they going to do? They're going to buy stuff over the internet. So uh, it was just simple investing strategy of saying there's a good opportunity to buy a stock that it, uh, you know, is, it might do well in this market. And then one I've always wanted to buy, but I've never been able to justify that kind of price to earnings ratio. Yeah, yeah. We've talked about it in the past. It's kind of ironic because um, you know, we've talked about like the FANG. I mean, now the FANG stocks are probably you know, worth more than the entire uh, global mining industry. Uh, yeah, I would say that you wouldn't have to say the FANG stocks in plural. I think you could say uh, probably no more than two, and I would guess not even fully two. Uh, I would think if you took Amazon and and half of Microsoft or something like that, you'd probably be be taking the entire value of the worldwide mining industry. Mm -hmm. So that leads, that leads to another stock, and that was actually the last stock that I bought personally. I bought some shares of a private company that we own uh, that – uh, strategic controls and uh, and the reason is it's in a sector that that uh, I think has got enormous upside it's the it's a company called Terra CO2 which is working on uh, on a uh, replacement for Portland cement and the idea there is hey if we're successful the upside is enormous we're looking at something that's got our stock that or an industry sorry that's got about a half a trillion dollar annual sales and penetrating that would be a big deal so it's just you know, you, you have to weigh your risks and rewards and go go where you think you got good leverage. Yeah, yeah. As we head into this, you know, gold bull market, Doug, um, you know, we've been through some pretty grueling uh, years. You know, I think a lot of uh, retail investors are pretty beaten down still. Uh, so, 
you know, how, um, I mean, how would you manage uh, on the upside, you know, when, when the, some of these stocks are, some of them are already starting to run, less so in the juniors, but the royalty companies, the bigger players, um, you know, it might be hard for a lot of people to, you know, to sell, sell it all uh, after a double, but how would you manage that personally as an investor? Well, I, I, I think you, you have to look at the fact that we've come off of about eight or nine years of uh, really depressed prices for gold and, yeah, normally I'd say you could get you could get out with a double, but I think you're going to leave a lot a uh, lot on the table at this point. Uh, this is a market that I think that the losers in will probably languish and ultimately disappear, but I think the winners you've got legitimate shots at five to ten times you know, the the bottoms that they've been coming off of. It's just that the whole industry is so depressed. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll it'll take time to filter down, as you said that. People have started to buy uh, the royalty companies. There was a lot of that started about two years ago in a big way as people began to see that, uh, you know, government spending was not being cur curtailed. It was really a uh, lot, lot of extra money being printed. Uh, then it filtered down to, you know, the majors, uh, the, the bigger companies that were, well, it first operated, floated down to the ones that had either Australian or pure Canadian players like Kirkland Lake. Uh, where the valuation of the commodity was done in in our dollar, or some of the American, right. uh, sorry, Australian ones, where it's in their dollar, and there was a world uh, at all time highs a couple of years ago. So those companies got a really early lift. The big integrated companies, the large operations in the U.S., it took a little bit longer to catch up, but they're they're getting some some uh, tailwinds now, and you're starting to see. Uh, that the really a lot of mergers have already started. Uh, you're starting to see it filter down now to what I would call second tier ones where the a troubled company is taken over by another operator who think they can sort out the affairs. Uh, today there was an announcement relating to uh, uh, Silver Core and, and Ghana Goldfields. Uh, right. uh, so I, I think that the new management feels they can, especially with this pricing, can get the problem sorted out. And I think you'll see it continue to filter down to, to uh, other stocks further down the, the food chain in time. But it, it right. really how, how long do you think that might, might take? I think it'll happen quicker than you think when it, when the, right. when it happens. Like it, it, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't see any reason why the price of gold isn't going to continue to go up. In fact, I see lots of reasons why it will, very few reasons for it to go down. Um, I think that you're going to see 1800 sometime in the next month or so. I think it'll test that level and, and break out. Um, I think that as soon as you get um, a little bit broader level of enthusiasm, as soon as you can, you, you can start seeing people taking money off the table and people start saying, wow, I made a bunch of money on such and such a stock, or I made a bunch of money on this stock, or I just all of my gold stocks have been buoyant and everything else is pretty depressed. You're gonna see more of migration back by retail investors. The funds, I think, already get it. A lot of the funds, uh, you know, they're they're limited in what they can do at, at the junior level. Uh, but they certainly, there's been a lot of migration into the bigger names uh, in the last few months. You start listening to BNN now, and almost everybody's talking about, you know, having some gold in their in some form in their portfolio as a hedge. Yeah, yeah. It started. And if you if there's been some great charts on uh, on on BNN in the last little while where people show that coming out of previous downturns, uh, for example, 2008 2009, gold led the market by about a year. And it mm -hmm. and it uh, you know by 2010 we were in good gold prices. It didn't peak for a year or so after that, uh, but it, it definitely led the market. And uh, so I, you know, if that's any kind of a model. Uh, you know, it, it was had a very steep, you know, about a year and a half, and you went from rock bottom to spectacular pricing. For yeah, what did uh, what did strategic shares trade at during that time? It got up over four dollars at the peak, and uh, so it was it, it, it was quite a lot. Hmm. Maybe we should uh, transition to um, to Rockhaven. So strategic owns, uh, and I should mention, strategic is one of uh, two sponsor companies of of uh, resource opportunities. Strategic owns about 36% of, uh, of Rockhaven, and you own a big chunk as well, don't you, Doug? Yeah, yeah, we do, and uh, and I'm quite happy, to believe it or not, still to be owning it. I say quite happy. 
uh, you know, we bought most of our shares at higher prices. But the, the fact is that uh, I think Rockhaven is a good example of the kind of company that struggled through the last eight or nine years of poor metal prices or continually declining metal prices. Um, it, they've kept moving ahead. Uh, they've done some resource estimations. Uh, they've uh, made new discoveries. They, uh, they they took a look at their economics once before, and at that pricing, uh, which was done at 1,200, it didn't look very good. But uh, today's pricing, uh, and you don't have to go all the way up to, I can tell you, at, at, at 1,700, it looks fantastic. And yeah. You don't, have to, you don't have to go anywhere near that far to, to get into the, the range where it's beginning to look very Right. Would it, would a new PEA look uh, somewhat different from the 2016 oh, yeah. one? Yeah, for, for a couple of reasons. One of the last rounds of drilling they did, they took a lot of the inferred resources and moved them into indicated, about 60% of what they have. And that was really interesting because that work showed that uh, there was actually quite a significant grade increase in the resources that went from inferred to indicated. Normally, mm -hmm. it goes the other way. And uh, so it, that's important. Uh, it, it means that mining the same volume of rock, you're gonna produce more gold. Uh, so that's, that's attractive. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, they did some other, other tweaking and looking at the, at the model they used before. And I think that uh, between those changes, the, the improvement in the grade of, uh, of the resource and, and uh, quite frankly, the, the, the increasing price of gold, well, I think that together they'll make it look quite attractive, but it is what it is. Uh, the, the resource was done on veins. They're relatively narrow. Uh, they have got, the majority of them have got refractory metallurgy. So as they explore that, there, there are limitations to how good they can make it. They can, they can show the descent economic, but the problem is that there's a lot of mineralization that isn't necessarily captured because it's deeper than what you can drill off bring into resources or its own parallel structures. And the amount of drilling that's required doesn't really change the economics much. You spend a lot of, take a lot of dilution right now and those costs can be deferred until you've paid back capital and, and you're operating from with positive cash flow. So there's no urgency to, to find more. They've got enough and it's good enough right now to make it. Where they could go to change the story is if they, um, were to go and look at some other parts of the property. There's areas on the property where they've got um, stockwork style mineralization. And so that's in the southeastern part of the image that's on the screen right now. As they go to the southeast, there's a transition from those purple areas, which are the existing resources, narrow veins with refractory uh, mineralization. Uh, the, the gold is, is in arsenal pyrite to a large degree. It doesn't leach with cyanide. As you go to the southeast, you're getting lower grades, but more a bulk tonnage type configuration. And the test work has shown that that material is highly cyanidable. So the eastern zones are a largely unexplored area, which, especially as metal prices improve, could really look attractive. It's a little bit further east of that, the mineralization, um, there are indications that there's a porphyry center in there where you could have porphyry copper style mineralization. And there's been very little drilling done on that target. And uh, that would be, again, a, a game changer. It'd be very much an open pit, uh, bulk tiny style mineralization where you'd have copper and gold together. Um, so there are different styles of mineralization that could be discovered. But the fact of the matter is, for Junior to look at all of them simultaneously is very, very difficult. And it's almost one of these situations where their rock cable suffers from having too many targets to, to work on. Um, so anyway, I think that they'll, you will see a new PEA come out. I think it'll be robust. Uh, I think there's gonna be interest in the project because there is potential to really increase, increase the resources. And I think there's potential for discovery of other styles of mineralization, which could be real, you know, haven't even begun to be evaluated. So that's why I think it's worth holding on. I, and I, I'd be a buyer at these levels for sure. And, you know, comes up the point right now they've got enough money to do a good program this year but I'd certainly invest again if uh, if they need the more. Well, I think you've been a buyer at higher levels than this, right? Oh yeah. I 
Uh, most so why, of what, what's yeah. the market missing? Like, why is the, you know, why, why is the valuation seem so low? Uh, what, what seems to happen with a lot of projects is they get characterized. Well, first of all, if it isn't an active, like a, like a new discovery, there's a tendency for investors to look at, at projects as being old news. So right. it's really hard to get back in front of people and get their attention again. So that's, that's problem number one. Problem number two is a lot of investors have a tendency to pigeonhole projects really quickly. And, and it's pigeonholed on the basis of something that they think that they understand. So this one, the fact that the, the veins of the far end are uh, refractory, there's a lot of people that's just, oh, don't tell me about it. I don't want to hear refractory. That that's gonna, means it's going to cost more money. Well, the, the economic studies they're looking at allow for that. They, they, they have a correction or oxi oxidation technique. And, Again, you hear that and a lot of people think, boy, you gotta, you got to heat all the rock up this mine and, and, and treat it very specially. Well, in this particular case, it's only about 12% of the ore has to be treated that way. The rest of it uh, is fine. So, so it's, it's a consideration uh, rather than a, a fatal flaw. Yeah, it is, it, it is, it is something that's going to kill the project. It's a bit of a complication. But for investors, investors like brand new stories. They like sort of unlimited potential. And as you begin to, to explore a project and you start putting out resources, it sounds like you, you sort of limited your discovery potential. Well, in this particular one, a lot of the best mineralizations are all the way along the bottom of what they drilled, it's wide open to depth. It's just that as you drill longer holes, it costs more money, obviously, to drill a really deep hole. And if you have to drill two or three or 400 meters to get down to the level of discovery, then then obviously, you know, the, the the cost for discovery is, is it's more expensive. So uh, those types of, of discoveries can be left and explored later on in the history of the mine. Uh, you can, once you've got underground development in place, you can put underground drill stations in and drill off those deeper resources and they can really extend the mine life. So uh, again, the study, the studies have been done on this deposit suggest that the mine life would be 10 to 12 years. Well, in actual fact, there's no reason to think you're limited there. Uh, as you go deeper, as you look on the parallel structures, the mine life is likely to be 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, and after you go through that first period where you pay back the cost of the mill, pay back the cost of putting the camp in, get your roads all completed, uh, you know, get your underground mining equipment paid for, you know, at that point, uh, you've learned so much about the deposit, all your costs are covered, and you know it could be a really really good producer for many many years. Um, that's the the problem of a vein type deposit is that you can't like you can with an open pit go in and scoop it all out in, in ten years and walk away from it. Right. The probability is it's going to be a longer lived like the operations a lot of the mines in eastern Canada are exactly the kind of they've been operated for generations. They just and keep going and going. Yeah. Yeah, they're still good producers, and it's just that you have to realize what what the character of the deposit is, and that's the character, apparently, of this deposit. Now, if they explore somewhere else and find a stockwork zone, or if they find a porphyry, or if they go somewhere else in the property and find a wider structure, that, that, or much higher grade structure than what they've seen, then yeah, that, that changes your mind model. But the fact is, they've got something right now that makes really good sense. So uh, I, my, my feeling is you put it into production and, and, uh, and continue to explore well, later on and see what else you find. Would Strategic ever consider, um, you know, putting it into, I mean, you're not a mining company, but would you consider uh, putting it into production uh, yourself in any scenario, like if the stock? No, continues? well, I, I would never say no, but, uh, but I, I think I prefer quite frankly to find a, a really good mining partner, somebody who, uh, you know, is very, very comfortable with underground mining, um, uh, someone who, who is comfortable running uh, you know, operations that are, uh, you know, where the, where the metallurgy is, is somewhat more complex. And there, there are lots of companies out there that are adept at that. And I think it's just a question of them getting their balance sheets in line and being able to make new investments. And because again, quite frankly, uh, there hasn't been a lot of really successful exploration done by a lot of partners that are a lot of companies in the last, uh, you know, 10 years. So, uh, as the various projects are taken out, there's going to be more and more incentive for these companies to look further down the 
food chain, look maybe at smaller deposits or ones that have a bit more challenged or go back and look at them again and say, wow, I did, I'd forgotten that there was all this potential there. And so that's where I think you could see the, the takeoff start to occur. Right. Okay, good. Why don't we uh, wrap it up there? Thanks for your time. Oh, no problem at all, James. Let's yep. do it again. Thank you. Okay, Thank take you. care. Yeah, bye.